that I'd like you all to register. One of them, of course, is very much that as a country, how can we go about saying it's we open doors and it's okay for irregular people to be in and out. It's like protecting your national boundaries. And this is not India doing this. This is every country in the world doing this, where they're taking a stronger stance because they believe that it helps protect the labor market for their nationals. I'll tell you how that works out, but that's what they believe. And then um, for India, I think it's also an image issue, frankly speaking. You know, we like to have this image um, where... We are, we are good migrant sending country, where the, you know, we, we want to pursue regular migrants going, and that's a good stance to have. It's good that we want to see regular migrants going. But it's almost as if we want to try and keep that market, and we want to keep that image, and we want to protect it for ourselves. And, and so if we appear as a country that actually is promoting regular migration, taking a very strong stance under irregular migration, um, you know, we, we are the ones who will actually gain in the long term from this. We may, we may not, but that's how it's looked at. And then there may just be another third angle, which some of us, which increasingly in my work I find and I find quite disturbing. I meet a lot of irregular migrants who are Indian, and they are Indian. Um, they do seek various recourses to be in other countries, and, and uh, they are rejected by the Indian government very often. The Indian government does say that, how do we know you're Indians? We don't know, you know, there's all this. And, and there is a similar thread somewhere along these people, and, and this is what captures my attention sometimes. They do belong to certain groups of India. They don't belong to you and me classes. The irregular migrants don't necessarily come from a certain class, a certain caste, a certain group. They come from minorities very often. You will have differences in the Gulf where large numbers become irregular for their own legal spaces, and those may be still more mixed. But the other Indians that you will find who are irregular in Europe, for example, um, some of them even finding their way, lots of them in the UK perhaps, come from certain minority groups. And I'd like you to just keep this thought because I'll try and come back to it later. But when you look at you know, India having this posturing of we, we send regular migrants, we are very strongly against irregular migrants, what is the implication? What will India do? What will India do here? What will India do as a country? If you ask me, more borders, more detentions, more deportations. For me, this is what India is aiming to do. And as, as a, you know, someone who works uh, with migrants, and I've been doing this for more than a decade now, actually almost two decades, I would say, um, you find that, is this going to prevent irregular migrants from coming in? This is the question I ask. Is this going to stop them? The answer is no. It isn't. This, this doesn't work like this. The global world doesn't work like this. And, and this is where also uh, one has to understand and what uh, also Mr. Guruchan was saying, while goods move and there's free movement, people don't have free movement. But it doesn't mean that the forces are not there for them to move. And, and so I'm going to try, I, I come from a labor organization. So I'm going to try and look at it from a labor perspective. Now this may be a little different from where you're coming from because you're lawyers probably. But um, just so that you understand it, and, and I'm going to try and simplify it so that you, know, you get where I'm coming from. So now you have, um, try to look at a country like India. We have a very large population. We actually have um, a lot of underemployment. Unemployment figures vary, but we have a fair amount of unemployment. And it kind of beats the logic. When you have so many people who need jobs, when you have so many youth who are unemployed, why is it that the jobs are going to the migrants? How come the migrants are filling these jobs? What's going on here? How come there are jobs that migrants can even take? And then you look, and then you have to understand that there are structural flaws. The labor markets and what is happening is operating in a certain way. And you see, and, and you see this around the world, but you see this very much happening in India. And, and what you see is if you have, um, more flexibility in the labor market. So we're introducing labor reforms we just kind of have, um, where you allow for more outsourcing, where there's more flexibility, where there are lesser inspections, 
where you have um, labor markets which are opening up, yes, and so they're trying to make it easier for companies to do manufacturing. But then you also have um, stratification of workers. You know, the same rights are not given to migrants as they are given to other nationals. What will happen in this situation? What happens when this happens to a labor market? And this is happening around the world, mind you. What will happen? There's a race to the bottom. There is a race to get the cheapest labor. There is a race to get, to undercut, to undercut wages, to undercut working conditions. You can do all of this because the system is now allowing you to do this and actually in a sense almost promoting that this can happen. So that there is more manufacturing, so that there is more work for people. But who can undercut? Who is the weakest chain in a labor market? It will be the migrant. It will always be the migrant who can undercut, who will work even lower than somebody who can work, who will go one step lower, whose working conditions can be even squeezed further. And this is for a few reasons. One, of course, that may be, and, and you can even just look at Bangladesh and India, for example, if the minimum wage is 80 there, you will earn more here. So yes, there is an income that, that a migrant can make. And so for them, even that little added value is good enough, it's pull enough. But then they won't ask for their rights. They won't. So you can squeeze them more because they cannot. And so you will always find that there's somebody who's bringing the labor further down and the migrants keep filling that. And then you wonder, well, well, is that? And then there's this rhetoric that, oh, the migrants come in so we don't have the jobs. And it's very easy to blame it on them. It's almost, they're the scapegoats of where countries are failing, of where governments are failing. To actually say, well, you don't have a job because there are all these people coming in, and so we need to have an entire discourse that actually is based and targeting them as if they are the ones who created this problem, as if they are the ones who actually came and took the jobs. And, and you have to, um, you know, and then they become the target and they become uh, the scapegoats for, these, for, for many powers, actually. And this is happening around the world. This is happening in Europe. This is happening in the US, that the migrant is targeted. Whereas actually, when you look at it, this, this is not um, a migrant problem. This is not also um, the problem of them coming and taking your jobs. And I'll give you an example, and it's, and it's an example that really uh, stayed with me because I thought, how, how can this happen? But you know, there were, and this is of um, another country, but it's just so that you can understand what it does to a labor market. And, and in another country, um, there were domestic workers coming in. Nobody wants these jobs, huh, by the way, where migrants work, people don't normally like these jobs. They, they are really the lowest jobs that exist. And domestic work is one of them. Um, and these See domestic workers... I'm going to have to interrupt you, sorry. Yeah, it's about two to three minutes. Okay, yeah, okay? sure. Thank you. Um, and then these... Um, uh, so just... Um, if these people are... Um, these domestic workers are doing the job, but over time, they're also taking care of the elderly. Yeah, because they do. At homes, they take care of the elderly. And then uh, suddenly... Um, the hospice, you know, not, not hospitals, but the middle care, the age homes and all of that sort, oh, we can get these people to do the jobs that are needed. So they hire them rather than hiring nurses. So what you have, you don't have professional workers now. It's coming down. You don't actually have a nurse working in these old age homes now. You have a domestic worker providing these services at very cheap rates. And then you have nurses saying, they're taking our jobs. Yeah, and you have, to, you have to think of why and how this is happening and how this gets solved because this doesn't get solved by squeezing the migrant. This actually gets solved by giving them rights. You just need to turn it around now. If the domestic workers have rights, if they have minimum wages, if places are protected, if those old age homes actually had minimum wor wages, working rights, had inspections, they wouldn't be going down. They wouldn't be allowed to get these people in because they've secured their markets at a certain point. So you don't actually work on squeezing the migrant. You work on restoring rights for them if they're in the country because they're the lowest rank. 
when you secure the market for them, when you let them organize, when they have higher wages, you automatically are working for your nationals. You automatically secure jobs for your nationals. You actually have professionalizations happen. So this is something that has not been thought of. This is something that everybody is working on the bandwagon of the migrants or the bad guys. We need to throw them out. And this is why I'm talking to you lawyers, because this is where fundamental law comes back. This is laws about equality. This is, this is fundamental labor laws as well, but also fundamental human rights, where the rights of people are secured by their right to work, by minimum wages, by the right to organize. And these fundamental rights are what protect markets, which finally actually protect nationals and their jobs as well. So you have to look at migration and migrants, not as the bad guys, but to understand that they work in a certain space, like they do in India. And I'm going to leave you with this last point, because I know I'm running out of time. We have, in this country, they say about two million Bangladeshis, and it's a big issue, no? We keep bringing it up. They're taking our jobs, they're the unwanted, they should be sent back, all of that. We also have five to seven million Nepalis, and it's not an issue. And it's not an issue because they're integrated, because we're not making it an issue. Because they are in the markets, but they get the same rights as everybody else does. And because they get the same rights, it's not an issue. They are integrated. They serve the market, and they serve the economy. And this is something to think about when you think of migration. Thank you. Thank you, Sita, for a very comprehensive, non-legal, practical perspective. Um, on labor and migration. Uh, I will ask Madhurima now to take the floor. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Madhurima Dhanuka. I'm the coordinator of the Prison Reforms Program at the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. And um, let me begin before they put on my PowerPoint, which has most of the information. So, um, so basically, when I thought about, when I started making the PowerPoint for today, I realized that there's so much to be talked about and I found it very difficult to try to focus on any one area. So I thought I'd rather go with everything and I'll talk about everything in bits and pieces and then during the conversation, then we can actually pick it up. So we've talked about uh, the Foreigners Act, we talked about the international law, we've talked about uh, labor, we talked about irregular and regular migration, but uh, we all talked about in, in all these threads, the thing was common is the Foreigners Act. Okay, we all talked about the Foreigners Act and how good or bad it is. And um, I'm not going to say my comments on whether I agree or don't agree with uh, what Sir had to say here, but uh, how we have come to know more about the Foreigners Act and how we have come to understand the differences or the difficulties of the Foreigners Act has been as part of our work on prison reforms. And how is because when we, we visit prisons very often, and I'm, I've been at this for a decade now, and the foreigners that we meet, and the problems that they face, and the problems we've had in terms of getting them out, um, when I say getting them out, that means repatriation, or if it's even about consular access, if it's about even their rights in prison, even a small thing like talking to your family member, everything comes to a standstill because of the problems that the Foreigners Act actually does pose. And uh, what I'm gonna do is, um, so, um, so I'll be talking about, you know, what, uh, another thing that I've realized over these years is, you know, if you want to look at a problem in, a, in, 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 any, in any criminal act or any uh, act that has an offense, look into a prison. You'll definitely find all the problems that happen in certain, someone or the other will end up in a prison and they'll tell you, okay, this is a problem. These are the lacuners that's existing in the system. And um, that's quite, it's quite intensive, it's quite, um, it's also quite quite undermining in terms of, you know, your understanding about oh my god, like these lacunas, these gaps. How could they? How did they ever be there? And even what's more difficult is to advocate for change or advocating for their removal or trying to make something which is not just like an individual case. So we work on policy, but we also have legal aid clinics uh, where we go to the prisons and we speak to the prisoners and get them legal aid access through the state-funded legal aid. So just to understand, you know, for us, it's not about helping one case. It's, to us, it's always been finding a problem from one case, and then how do you take it to the next level, which is to prevent any other cases from happening, which are dealing with the same thing. Um, so I think now I have to wait for my... Yeah. 
So yeah, anyways, uh, while they're getting it started, so I'll be talking about immigration detention, but I won't be talking just about immigration detention in a sense that India doesn't really, because the Foreigners Act doesn't acknowledge anyone else as there's nothing called mig migrants, there's nothing called refugees, there's nothing called uh, illegal economic or any kind of migrants, right? It's only non-Indian. So when you, if you are picked up and if you are uh, prosecuted, you're actually prosecuted as a non-Indian. You're not even prosecuted as, as another national, okay? The, the order won't say that you are a Bangladeshi or you're a Pakistani. There is no provision whatsoever to do any nationality verifications as part of the court process at the time of your prosecution. You basically, it is on you to decide, oh, I don't, if I don't have any documents, if I am, I don't have a good lawyer, I don't have any documents to prove where I am from, I am a non-Indian and I am prosecuted, right? So that means that, you know, you have a lot of people who end up in prison who might actually be Indians, but they just don't have the papers. They don't have access to their papers. So those kind of problems come in. And which is why detention in India is also about like every, so it's not just about immigration detention, whereas we are, where we are prosecuting people for just being uh, irregular or regular migrants uh, and uh, caught up with the law. And uh, yeah, I really need the powers now. I can't begin to explain anything without the thing at the back. lesser because we've all had quite a bit of time already to speak. We haven't really stuck to the 10 minute time limit. Okay. So the first slide, of course, was about how and why are we here and what do we do. So we've worked on, uh, I told you about my organization. We're an international organization. We have offices in, uh, in London, Ghana, and in India. Uh, we've worked on the foreigners issue for, since 2009 uh, when we started working on the Bangladesh, uh, Bangladeshis who were detained in, in West Bengal. And ever since, we've worked um, to facilitate the repatriation of uh, more than 400 prisoners then we worked on consular access, we worked on uh, communication with family. And we've also recently started, not recently, as in it's been two years, we've started working on facilitating access for uh, refugees who are in custody or asylum seekers. Uh, so they're both, they are people who have cards also, and they are people who are looking for uh, asylum here. And they are mostly to do with the Rohingya Muslims, of course. Now, in terms of we talked about, you know, we talked about how prison and Im imprisonment and detention, but I thought I should put it down at the basic things is, when do people find themselves in prison? And we talked a bit about um, if you're traveling without documents, of course, that's the case. But then if you're traveling on forged documents, if you travel documents that violate the condition of your stay, you travel documents, but the visa has expired. You travel documents, but committed a criminal offense. So it's not just when you're traveling without documents that you end up in prison. You also end up in prison for any of the latter three categories as well. And how do you find yourself in prison? Is, of course, the Foreigners Act, the Passport Entry into India Act, then the Foreigners Order is there, and then we have the Citizenship Act. These are the four basic acts under which uh, the procedures and you know different kind of the whole framework for immigration detention or just detention of foreigners uh, lies. Now, the framework international national, we talked about a few, but then internationally, if you're looking at a framework, we also need to look at uh, what actually talks about your um, the, the condition of your stay when you're in prison, the, the provisions or the special uh, needs groups and all of that. So you have, of course, you have the Nelson Mandela rules, which talk about prisons and the minimum standards in a prison. You have the body of principles for all persons for detention and imprisonment. You have, of course, the Convention on Consular Relations. I'll talk about it a little later on how that is very important when you talk, when, when you come, uh, when you talk about foreign nationals. The UNODC Handbook on Prisoners with Special Needs. So this handbook actually classifies foreign national prisoners as a category, as a vulnerable category. And this is very less known uh, among most circles is that foreigners actually constitute a special category which do require special assistance. And I've been at meetings where people have actually talked to us and they said, 
oh you've talked about foreign nationals why do you need to talk about foreign nationals they like for 1% of your population but that's not the point they are human beings you know if you even if you're one that doesn't matter you are one um the constitution of india of course talks about the basic rights you have the ministry of home affairs and external affairs their letters circulars advisory standard operating procedures on deportation on timelines on um on detention centers on on how the detention center should be where should they be set up what are the conditions most of it is not taken up by states and then you have of course the state prison manuals you have the state police manuals you have the prisons act and then you have judicial pronouncements now, now these are the basic and these are quite a lot i should tell you about in terms of any other subject that you talk about where you'll find very one or two you know international convenience or indian law here you have a lot of things yet what we find is it's still not enough now looking at worldwide so as everyone's talking everyone's on the move but that also means that there's a lot more immigration detention so there are around 4 uh, 460,000 foreign prisoners across the world no surprise the usa seems to have the most of them and again these might not be including the figures who of people who are in who are in detention centers these are generally usually these are figures compiled by the world prison brief and they are usually to do with prisoners who are in prison um so the numbers could be way higher now in india okay so we have the figures which is 6185 and uh, not surprisingly the chunk is in west bengal which is because they're all most of them are bangladeshis this again also does not include figures from detention centers because if it did assam would be very well somewhere here then you have those awaiting repatriation is another category which it is it is in itself illegal detention because if you're still in prison after completing your sentence you are essentially in illegal detention and there are numbers and numbers of people who spent time illegally detained in indian prisons even at this point of time i know of people who spent 14 years in a prison for a sentence that was for one year so uh, so those ish cases of course are there now these don't really tell you the exact numbers or you know how it is and this is again 2015 because the ncrb hasn't come out with the new new statistics uh, till now so we filed uh, rtis early this year and uh, we we were trying to look at you know how many people have had consular access how many people have been are awaiting repatriation how many people are actually stateless as in their nationalities are not known and this is what we got so we got 26 responses um we came to know about 300 3908 foreign nationals they were from 58 nationalities they are under trial 1647 convicts 377 and repatriations 871 now the problematic figures were 522 nationalities are not known okay who are these people awaiting repatriation 871 that's like a huge number the, this is all illegal detention 5.7% have received consular access this is like a extremely low figure for um for people because in in another country your consulate is your next of kin and you can't go anywhere without you know doing that now we we then talked about you know what are the barriers you know how, where are the barriers really coming from and the barriers are really coming at every stage if you look at it so at the time of arrest the biggest barrier as i said there is no mandate to you know to give um for police to provide information to the consulate so only a few prison police manuals and even the model prison manual uh, mo model police manual talks about the fact that the police are supposed to inform the consulate whenever a person is arrested however that doesn't happen in most of the cases most of the embassies we visit they say we only find information about uh, arrest of a person from reading the newspapers and that's about it there is no other information that is coming through from the uh, from the official channels which is very problematic and we'll learn about that later on as i explain the process adjudication now we talked about the foreigners act now what does the foreigners act do it reverses the burden of proof for every i am sure you're all lawyers you all know about burden of proof and you all know that who is responsible the, the state is responsible in proving in in the case of foreigners the person is responsible to prove that you are a national of which country or actually if you're an indian national or not and which is hugely problematic especially in a country like india where you know the legal the challenges about incompetence uh, unawareness um, illiteracy so it's extremely problematic for this burden of proof to be there without any safeguards which a certain or which actually benefit the person who's there and who if he's if they're incapable of making good defense then again dealing with statelessness now because that is a huge problem here and it is the point is when you, when are you a stateless person when you if 
no other country accepts you as your no other yeah, no no country accepts you as their own you become a stateless person we don't have any guidelines there's something that the delhi high uh, delhi high court has given but then um just in a, in a national framework we don't have anything to deal with stateless people which again causes huge problems you know the people who are awaiting repatriation are actually they those people because if you don't have a nation nation to go to where do you go so you end up in prison that's the you know easiest thing of for people to do, send them to a prison, forget about them, they don't exist. Um, detention, of course, the detention conditions are there. Consular access, again, here also becomes a problem because uh, in most parts, the cons consulate is the one who informs your family. So if the consulate um, has not come, your family probably doesn't know. And it did happen. I, I actually called up a mother two and a half years after the detention of her son to tell her that her son was in prison and she had no idea. She thought, we don't know where he had gone. So. Um, that's another problem. Uh, your lack of contact also begins with the fact that uh, writing letters is, of course, very expensive, very tedious. Letters re take around a month or two to reach wherever they are intended to reach. Phone calls, wherever they're permitted, uh, either you pay yourself or either they don't allow you ISD calls. There's only provision for calling uh, locally uh, in most of the provisions. Then. then now you have the option of video conferencing. So now uh, very few states and very few prisons have started using video conferencing as a means for ensuring contact. So this is something that needs to be more pushed upon for. Uh, your lack of provisions to meet special needs, your diet. You can't really, you know, a lot of the Rohingyas who are in detention in West Bengal are really, um, they're not happy with the kind of food they get. Or if you're a Nigerian and you're stuck in a prison where they don't serve you meat. You know, all these issues uh, have been, they do tend to lessen or they do actually aggravate your conditions and they actually do end up in violence and you know frustrations that actually build in inside when you have to you know have probably rice or if you have to have any food which is not really what you want to eat um cultural of course lingual is another problem there is a bolivian lady who speaks only spanish and believe it or not me and the superintendent actually tried to converse with her using google translate because there was there are no provisions for interpreters there are no provisions to have anyone else there uh, now the completion of sentence. Now this is the most difficult part, which takes like a long time, and sometimes it's like forever for most of them. So of course you delay in nationality verification. Now you don't start at the rest. You're starting, you know, when someone's completed the sentence. Now you start nationality verification. So what happens? It's been already ten, probably five, six years. There's the family's already lost track. So there's of course no one there, and there's no address. The person also doesn't remember where, he, where he's from. So what happens? There's inordinate delay in nationality verification. Delay in obtaining emergency travel certificates. Then insufficient funds to support travel. So now Foreigners Act is basically simple imprisonment. You're not supposed to, you're not, uh, you're not allowed or you're not mandated to work in when you're in prison. That means you're not even earning anything. So you probably might not have money to spend to go back. So there's a lot of cases which also happen that, so it's not that uh, there is a trend these days that the FRROs, that's the Foreigners Regional Registration Officers, they don't uh, really, they're not, convicting or they're not prosecuting you at the first go you are given time to submit a penalty and then remove yourself from the country but then if you don't have money then you actually end up behind bars and then of course when you're behind bars you still don't have money so you spend five years and then you spend another five years because you don't have money to pay for your travel back home so you're either begging someone you're asking someone or you're actually getting people to commit some acts for you outside and we actually did we did a case uh, of a person of a footballer from the Ivory Coast, where we actually had to resort to crowdfunding to get him money so that he would stay out of prison. He was given a penalty, and then we had to you know, get that money from crowdfunding sources so that we could ensure that he doesn't spend the next five years in prison, and then another five years just trying to get the money to now go back home, because that's not going to happen. Then the barrier, again, logistic arrangements, approvals. There's a lot of things. You need airlines approvals. You need the, uh, if you're going to the IC ICPs, you need approvals from the border security forces. So all those things can take a lot of time. Now I thought, no, the complication of the process is here. And I'm not gonna explain this. This is the process that it takes for a foreign national to be sent back to their country. And this is like, yeah, there's a lot of information. And which is why I actually put it there because it is, it is the, you know, the, I don't know how to say it, but it's, it is a very fairly complicated and long test and it goes through N number of desks. There's the MHA involved, there's the MEA involved, there's the State Department involved, it's the FRRO is involved, the prison department's involved. So like everyone is involved in this entire thing and even the, in, uh, even the embassies are involved. So like, it's like a multi, 
multi-dimensional thing that goes on whenever a prisoner has to be sent back or any person, even if it's not a prisoner, any person who doesn't have a valid, uh, valid document, if they have to be sent back, then it's like a long process. Uh, what I do want to focus on is, um, so all of this information, you know, whenever the police have to inform the, uh, the embassy or the prison has to inform the embassy or the state government wants to inform, it all has to go through the MEA. There is no, there is, that channel is so set in stone that there is no other way around it. And that also means that if you send something now, it probably might reach them like a month later. And if they send something back to us, it'll come on again a month later. So you know, that kind of problems are there. That's one of the bigger things on the whole process. Then of course, the informed information on arrest doesn't happen. The embassy is not informed of de decisions when a conviction takes place. So they have no idea where the prisoners are. Um, Issuing of emergency travel documents should be done two months before the process, but in actual, it actually happens probably three or four months later from after you've done, done your sentence. Um, the time taking provisions, of course, consular visits. Now, an uh, embassy can, has to write to MEA to get permission to go and visit him in prison. That takes a lot of time. Um, contact family for funding. Now, your family might not, as I said, if you've not spoken to your family in 10 years, you don't know where the family has gone to. So we were trying to do this case of a Palestinian. His family had actually moved to Egypt, and his parents were not there. And, the, and we finally, the embassy was able to locate the niece. But that's like a very rare case. For all the others, and especially the Nigerians that we deal with, there is nothing. There is no family. There is no one. There's a Ukrainian also, the person I was talking about, the 14 years one. He had a one-year sentence, and he's been still in prison. He doesn't want to go back. He doesn't have a family. So if we had you know, ensured that contact when he was arrested, he probably would still have contact with his family and wanted to go back. Uh, of course, the trial takes time, as with everyone else. The deportation order has to be issued, which can take a lot of time. The police inform to arrange escorts. Now, escorts, again, it's a huge problem. There are no escorts. There are too many duties. There's too m many vacancies. Um, so this, one second, yeah. So this is essentially, you know, where the entire, you know, what are the issues in the process. And the reason I'm talking about this in detail is because this helps understand what are the problems in the law. Now, the problems in the law very specifically are, so the arrest, now, Article 36B, so the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations talks about, um, you know, about the uh, obligation on the competent authorities to inform the consular post of the concerned state if within, its if within its consular district, a national of that state is arrested or committed to prison or to custody pending trial or is detained in any other matter. So whenever a person is arrested, whenever a person is sent to prison, whenever a person is transferred to a detention center, the intimation has to be sent to the consulate. However, we have, no, we have absolutely no mandatory provision in the national law which says that. We just have, as I said, you have the model laws which talk, model police law which says, you have some state uh, police manuals talk about it, but that's about it. There is no, there is no, there is not even any uh, MHA or any uh, MEA guideline or circular which says that, that this has to be done. Now, education. So, as I said, Section 9 of the Foreigners Act, the onus of proving that such person is not a foreigner should lie upon such person. Now, this is, of course, problematic, as I explained. Statelessness, as I was saying, so you have the Sheikh Abdul Aziz case, which talks about some guidelines about it, but that's it was only for one case, that's not been extended to others. And of course, it's not uh, taken up elsewhere as well as far as uh, I know. And I do know there are a lot of stateless people who are in prison right now as we speak. Um, now the continued detention and deportation. Now where is the problem in the Foreigners Act? So of course, Section 2C, which says power to make orders for removal, which is fine. A country has the right to remove people. I think uh, that's fine. But Section 32EE, Foreigners Act, Power to make orders to reside in particular place impose restrictions on the movement. Now, these two things to me are very problematic, especially if you look at art Article 21. So Article 21, of course, talks about liberty and nobody can take it away without due process. Where is the process here? With the central government and in most of the cases uh, um, under Section 3, the, the, state, the central government has delegated a lot of its powers to the state government. Now, where is due process here? What, what in the world allows the government to detain someone indefinitely under these orders? You are actually taking away somebody's liberty without due process. And I, I think this is extremely problematic. And I also feel is a problem is that this has not been raised in the cases that are going on in the court right now, in the Supreme Court. They don't challenge the Foreigners Act. But what is needed is, to, is you need to challenge the Foreigners Act and ask where are the due process rights over here. 
Um, now this is, I'm just gonna end. We're coming out with this uh, uh, national study on foreigners in Indian prisons. We'll be releasing this in January. So any of you who want a copy, uh, please, uh, you can give me your email address. My colleagues are there. You can give your email addresses to them and we'll definitely send you. We'll also be having a consultation in Delhi. So if you want to be a part of it, you can just let us know. Yeah, all right, thank you. with regular status here having this conversation none of us looks like we're a migrant uh, and I think migrants in prison are even more invisible so it's good to have someone here who interacts with them who speaks to them on a regular basis as part of their work um, we are now going to open the floor for discussions amongst the panelists as I said uh, I'm happy to take questions from the audience as well shortly uh, but since the format requires us to start the discussion off, I will ask the first couple of questions maybe. Um, and then we can have questions from the floor. Is that okay? Okay. Um, I will...